I'm at uh, the University of Waterloo. Uh, I, I too am interested in ML security and privacy. <laughs> the joke will never get old. Um, and uh, yeah, my talk is going to be thematically similar to Shai's, uh, but sort of with a more empirical and uh, you know machine learning based focus. Um, and maybe that speaks as to, I, I personally at least believe this direction is a very important one for the future of uh, private ML uh, for reasons I'll get into during this talk. But um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about the very alliterative promise and pitfalls of public data and private ML. Um, yeah, let me start, start the timer. Cool. So yeah, uh, I'll start with this comic from XKCD, which maybe many of you have seen before if you've ever seen a talk on private ML. But um, in this comic here, you can see this individual is typing into their email client, say, long live the revolution, our next meeting will be at. And then they ask their email client to autocomplete it, and it suggests the docs at midnight on June 28th, suggesting that something illicit is going on at the docs at midnight uh, on June 28th. And um, in fact, that this is someone else's secret and uh, that it has been leaked by this user, uh, by, sorry, by the email autocomplete system, which is machine learning. And so when you train predictive models on input from your users, it can leak information in unexpected ways. So this is clearly just an XKCD comic, and it doesn't resemble real life at all, except that it does. Um, uh, yeah, essentially, here's a, here's a blog post by Wallace et al. from a paper, based on a paper by Carlene et al., which focused on GPT-2 and found that at least 0.1% of his tech generation, which is very conservative, are essentially copy-pasted from the training data set. Now, what does that mean? What, what, what can this entail? Um, here's one of the things that they did uh, in their paper. They, if you feed GPT-2, the prefix East Stroudsburg, Stroudsburg, whatever that means, into GPT-2, then it'll output Peter W's personal information about uh, you know, their, their company, their phone number, their email, their fax number, um, all of which is personal information. And maybe isn't something that we would want a machine learning model to be spitting out and publicizing. Um, that's not all, there's more things. They also found this from the same blog post. Um, they prompted GPT-3 with uh, the beginning of chapter three of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. And it, uh, see the bold part here. And it reproduced the entire page roughly before making any mistakes, which you know, maybe this isn't a privacy concern, but you could argue maybe this is a copyright concern. And still something we'd like to avoid. Uh, it's kind of a different but thematically similar issue. But the, the sort of underlying issue with both these examples is that uh, really machine learning models are memorizing things in their training data set, which may be things we don't want to reveal uh, when, when we're giving this out to users, because it could be private, sensitive, uh, copyright, whatever. So uh, the solution, which has already been mentioned a few times today, is, uh, well, one solution is differential privacy. So I'll... You've seen the definition. I want to give you my own perspective on how to think about differential privacy if you've never really grokked it before. Um, if you've seen it, then just bear with me for one slide. Um, the idea is you can picture that we have some sort of data set, and we feed it to an algorithm, and that algorithm produces an output. Now, an alternative, uh, in an alternative world, you can imagine that we fed in some data set X prime, which is similar to X, but it differs in exactly one entry which is instead fed into the algorithm and produces an output. Now, what happens is an adversary looks at the output of this uh, algorithm and tries to figure out, was I looking at X in the, sorry, am I looking at the output as if X was fed into the data set or if X prime was fed into the, uh, sorry, X or X prime was fed into the algorithm. And uh, if the adversary cannot really guess better than say a random guess, whether it was X or X prime that they're looking at the output of the algorithm on, then we say the algorithm is differentially private. So in the context of machine learning models, usually you're gonna be thinking of um, the algorithm as being say your training code for your machine learning model and the output as being the trained machine learning model. So ideally, imagine your adversary, this goose is looking at um, the uh, machine learning model which you've trained and just released to them. They're trying to figure out, okay, with some element in your training data set or not. And, uh, yeah, ideally, you know, here's the definition of differential privacy, which has already been mentioned, and I'm, I'm not going to sort of belabor it anymore. Um, looks something like that. But the main thing I want you to take away is that sort of differential privacy, in some rigorous way, prevents memorization of individual training examples, 
And it's also a quantitative notion and a rigorous notion and all this stuff. So it's a very well-accepted notion of privacy by the general privacy community. Um, yeah, rigorous notion, yeah, and kind of another way of saying it is the model is pretty much the same as if your data point is never trained on. So this sounds great, and we would love to have machine learning models, which are indeed differentially private. The question is, how do you make sure your machine learning model is differentially private? And it turns out that a good way to do this is shockingly simple. So how do we train machine learning models normally? The standard way is what's known as, well, SGD. So um, yeah, this is with a few missing numbers, stochastic gradient descent, in which you draw a mini batch of data points, compute the gradients, average the gradients, take a step, repeat. That's its gradient descent. I'm going to claim that as is. This does not satisfy the definition of differential privacy. If you do this on a model, it could, in fact, have a lot of sensitive information. In fact, like we saw those examples, that precisely demonstrates the type of uh, vulnerability of this type of thing, uh, this type of training algorithm. But it turns out it's fairly simple to make it actually differentially private just by adding in steps three and five, which are conveniently missing. And all you have to do is first, when you're doing these, uh, computing these gradients, what you're gonna do is make sure they're not too big. That is, imagine, you can imagine some setting where you have an incredibly large gradient, which would uh, have a lot of influence on your model. And that's like one point that's exerting a large influence. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure no point has too much influence by kind of clipping the gradient to some ball. So none of the gradients are too large. And then what we do later after we average it is we add noise so that kind of each individual uh, gradient's contribution is masked, uh, kind of limiting how much any of these clip gradients can uh, influence the final answer. So it turns out this very simple modification of uh, SGD in which you uh, do clipping and add noise. If you just train a model with this, somehow miraculously the downstream model is uh, is, is private in the sense that an adversary shouldn't be able to really extract out individual secrets based on the training data points. Um, yeah, and it's a drop-in replacement for SGD, and you can just train a model like this in this private. Um, any questions about this so far? Yes? May I uh, can you use the microphone? Oh, no, I want Uh, this one. Oh, sorry, sorry. Next. This, yeah. this, this one. Oh. No, yeah, yeah. Cool. Good. Cool. Okay. Um, if everyone's good with DTSGD, then uh, you know this seems too easy, right? It's told you here's one slide. All of private machine learning is solved, right? Obviously not. And the big catch is that um, I say accuracy is the biggest catch. For example, um, here is a paper, uh, one of my favorite papers in this area in the last few years by. Uh, Florian Tremere and Dan Bonnet, where uh, they, at the time, uh, got state-of-the-art results for uh, CIFAR-10. CIFAR-10, if you're not familiar, is like a classic image classification uh, benchmark. And they really, really did really amazing results, in my opinion. And they got the amazing accuracy of 69.3% on uh, CIFAR-10. Um, if you're familiar with uh, CIFAR-10 non-privately, this is like, you know, not baby's first, uh, like, image classification task, but baby's second image classification task. And, you know, this is crushed into the ground. We can get 98, 99%, uh, not privately. But if you include three differential privacy, we're down to 69%, which is like not usable. This is insane. Like going from 1% error to 30% error is just, just, you know, any practitioner will laugh you out of the room. And, uh, you know, yeah. So this is, this is not good. Uh, so it seems like differential privacy causes you, in some cases, to lose a lot of accuracy. Yeah. Maybe. So yeah, this is, this is a good point. The fact is that we have one algorithm which trains a model privately and it gets terrible accuracy. That does not mean that every way of training a model privately would necessarily get that. I think that's an interesting question if you can somehow prove like lower bounds on any algorithm for CIFAR-10. I, I don't, it, it's a weird question. But I think doing something like that would be very interesting if you can formalize that. But at least, yeah, you're right that this is just this one algorithm, but that's also the best we know. So, you know, so the question is, maybe is this the best you can do? Is there a better algorithm or so on? But at least uh, the solution I will propose is kind of the same one that was proposed in your talk, in fact, 
using uh, public data to sort of alleviate the issues. So this is actually, uh, okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit from, I showed you an example on CIFAR 10, which is image classification, but we're going to shift gears to, uh, you know, text, uh, like large language models. And this is kind of how uh, machine learning models and large language models are trained in general nowadays. Um, they're first pre-trained on large amounts of public data, which is available online. So typically, when you, whenever you download, say, BERT or uh, uh, like GPT-2 or something like that, they're typically pre-trained on a large, diverse public data set. That is, you know, tax data downloaded from the internet, things like Wikipedia, Project Gutenberg, um, you know, the common crawl data set is one of the things that people use for this, if you're familiar. Um, and then, so things are typically pre-trained using, say, self-supervised learning uh, using SGD. Now, the, yeah, and I want to then imagine that we fine-tune on a small task-specific private data set. So this is generally how large language models are still used in the non-private setting, but the difference is I want to focus on the case where the data set is sensitive and maybe we have to train uh, with DPSGD. For example, things like user data, user emails, medical data, and so on. Um, so I'm kind of distinguishing between two types of data. One is public data, which is large and sort of diverse, which we're going to use for pre-training. And then the other one is smaller, private, and more focused on the downstream task. Uh, and we're going to imagine using SGD for the first part, but private SGD for the second part. So we kind of give heterogeneous privacy guarantees depending on which subset of the data we're looking at. Um, and like I said, this is kind of a broader agenda. When and how much can public data help with private data analysis? Um, and at least intuitively, you know, this trans transfer learning is a, a common word nowadays, and maybe that could help us do better. Any questions about the general paradigm of public versus private data? Cool. So that kind of is natural and intuitive. You might have, like, there might be something bothering you in this slide, um, you know, public data, download from the internet, like, is there any issues here? Well, hold that thought. We'll come back to that. But at least um, let's, let's talk about, let's, let's take this for granted that this is a setting we're going to work in. And um, yeah, there's been some work in this direction, and I want to show you something from, okay, I didn't, I, I missed the citation of the paper. We had an iClear last year by you et al. Um, and what we showed in this work uh, is that, for example, you can fine tune these LLMs privately. So there's a lot of numbers here, but I just want to focus on, say, let's just focus on this number here, 93.4, which is the sort of reported number on a certain model, Roberta Large, without privacy. And then using some of the techniques in the paper, which I'm not going to talk too much about, we meant to fine tune it privately at epsilon equals 6.7 to 90.3% 90 accuracy. So the main, the main thing is I want to get across is that this is like 93.4 minus uh, 90.3. That's maybe a 3% average drop on these tasks from non-private to private, which is much more palatable than that 99 to 69% uh, accuracy drop that we witnessed for CIFAR 10. So like the takeaway here, while I said before a practitioner would laugh you out of the room for telling them you can get 69% on CIFAR 10, I think something like this is not, you can at least have a conversation. And in particular, like, I think there was a common belief that by practitioner that differential privacy is horribly impractical, but I think this at least starts a conversation, okay, maybe we could be able to do it potentially. Um, it also works for NLG tasks on GPT-2, um, so this is other stuff, well, I, I won't focus too much, but it's not like too overfit to say just like, uh, you know, Roberta style tasks. Um, another finding we had was that, interestingly, bigger models are better. This might be getting into a little bit of inside baseball, um, but uh, one thing I want to highlight here is that, so let's, let's compare some things. Uh, so here we have at the top, Roberta Base, and down here we have Roberta Large. Roberta Large, as the name suggests, is a larger model than Roberta Base. And I want to show you, first of all, this number here, 87.2, is the private uh, accuracy we get on Roberta Base. And this number here, 90.3, is the private accuracy we get to on Roberta Large. So the first thing I want to say is that this is a better absolute error for the bigger model. 
And the other thing I want to highlight is the fact that the drop due to privacy, that is, if you take 91.8 minus 87.2 versus 93.4 minus 90.3, you'll see that this is actually a smaller drop in terms of absolute error. So it seems like there's less of a drop due to privacy. So in some way, bigger models are better in terms of utility in more than one way. Now, if you come from the non-private uh, world, this might be, yeah, of course, we know kind of, you know, stack more layers, you know, scale is all you need. These are the bigger things. They're always better. Um, but this was a little bit surprising to me and other folks in the differential privacy community at the time because there was kind of a running conventional wisdom that maybe bigger models are worse for differential privacy because you have to add more noise. Um, and that's still true in some settings, but I think at least this and some other works around the same time suggested that maybe there's more to it. Somehow it's not just more size is worse uh, in terms of the scale of the model, maybe there's more to it. Yeah. I think it's really important to understand the which is how much data private compared to how much the data was public. Because it's only a meaningful amount of private data, and then practically doing it without privacy. Right, good question. And the question was roughly along the lines of, uh, you know, it kind of matters how much of the data is public, how much is private. Yeah, we kind of, we, we, in this paper at least, we didn't like really dig into that or like the relationship between the public and private data set. We just sort of said that NLP people care about this task. They use Roberta, which is like pre-trained on whatever data is pre-trained on. We'll just see for this specific benchmark that people have been looking at, uh, how does it do? But you are totally right, and we'll return to that as well, rethinking some of these benchmarks, because maybe these are not really meaningful for the settings we care about in privacy. So hold that thought as well. Yeah, question over there. Can you use the mic? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, like, okay, there's this percentage train parameters column here is uh, the question, and like, yeah, there's one thing I didn't get into at all, which is we tried to do some parameter efficient methods thinking that would be better based on the conventional wisdom I mentioned before. Um, it turns out that this is actually not a big deal. There was a simultaneous work by Shui Chen Li at all, um, which kind of shows that even if you do full fine tuning, that is not using these parameter efficient methods, we kind of thought were very important to this thing, then it still does really well. So, yeah, I'm just saying this, this, this column is a red herring. Don't, don't sweat it too much. Uh, you can do parameter efficient things if you want, but it's not a big deal. Cool. Any other questions before I move on? Cool. Um, so, yeah, kind of the bigger picture here. Like, I want to kind of explain maybe, you know, hand-wavingly explain why this helped. And the metaphor that I like to say, at least, is that imagine you didn't use a pre-trained model for private NLP. That would be as if you're pretending the entire English language itself is private information. So somehow, we would want a model which starts by understanding English, whatever that means. And then after it understands English, then maybe it can train uh, on how to, say, do uh, like diagnosing what illness someone has from the text of the symptoms. Right, like, you know, it, when, when somebody's learning to uh, be a doctor, you don't just start by, like, uh, giving them diagnoses in a totally different language that they don't know. You assume they know English first. So the kind of not perfect metaphor I use is that maybe your language model should know English before you try to do it uh, on something which is privacy sensitive. And indeed, English syntax and grammar are not things we typically consider to be private. And I want to comment that this... Yeah, it, it dramatically improves the accuracy in private ML and also for vision paths. This is a figure from a paper by the same one that I really love, by Florian Tremere and Dan Bonnet, where they show that if you use some, say, labeled CIFAR 100 data, um, then it can raise the accuracy from, like, that 69% I showed you to 80%. And if you also use SimClear v2, which essentially treats unlabeled ImageNet, which is an even bigger data set as public, then you can get up to, say, 93% which is inching closer and closer towards, like, uh, you know, the state of the art. It's still a fair bit worse, but it's a much better than we saw before. And, in fact, there's an even more recent paper by uh, Day et al., which, you know, treating ImageNet as public data, then you can get, say, 95% plus, even with fairly stringent uh, privacy budgets of epsilon equals one. So 
the kind of story I told you earlier where differential privacy inflicts irreparable amounts of, uh, of uh, harm to your utility, currently that seems like uh, it, it's hard to really fully recover from that in the setting where you don't have public data. But if you allow some data to be public, then, um, then you can almost entirely recover. So, yeah, go ahead. I mean, and I think it's, it's, I think it's essentially the same thing in the sense that, you know, there's many ways to encode prior knowledge. So this paper by Tremere and Bonnet, which I keep gushing about, one really in, uh, interesting thing there is like, okay, how are people trying to do image classification before? Deep network, you know, that's, that's what we know, that's what we love, and that's what does well. But they use an alternative type of uh, architecture called scatternet. The idea that it takes an image and it converts it into, uh, like, it does a feature extraction of things which have been demonstrated to be, like, useful for um, the non-private setting, uh, just for image classification in general, does various, like, Fourier transforms of the image or something like that. Basically, if you know something is an image to start with, then maybe these features are good to use, look at. And so that's another way of encoding this prior knowledge that we're looking at natural images. And so that's why they meant to do better than previous works, which just did straight up CNN. So it just seems that in some cases, public data is a very good way to encode these prior, this prior information because we don't know how to quantify it otherwise. But yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, another question back there. If, if you could use the microphone so the audience can hear. Hi, my question is about how you're measuring accuracy in private ML. So how would you kind of quantify, for example, the Harry Potter uh, example you gave me, right? So a certain part of it is actually copyrighted, and that would be the error. But how do you really, like, find that overlap? How, do we have a different way we're calculating accuracy in private ML versus, like, just the usual? Good question. So you're asking about, there's sort of two things that uh, I want to be careful not to conflate. One is, like, the accuracy, meaning, how accurate is your classifier? Let's forget about privacy, but see, does it get the test data right? Now, you're kind of asking about um, the privacy and overlap. Like, for example, how do you tell if you've, you know, matched something in the training data set or not? So that is not typically measured. You can measure it. There's things called membership inference attacks and privacy auditing to try to measure things. But really, the convenient thing about differential privacy is once you prove that it is epsilon equals four differentially private, then, in fact, that gives you some rigorous bounds on the type of whatever privacy failure uh, can come up. So these are sometimes a little bit quantitatively weak in the sense that, um, yeah, these, these are loose and they don't really give strong guarantees for the epsilons we look at. But nonetheless, usually it just an, implies you've proven that it doesn't uh, leak information that way. Okay. Is it green? Yeah, it's now. Cool. Um, Quick follow-up on that. So these benchmarks you're talking about, right, uh, whether it's, I don't know, privacy auditing, or you're trying to, like, quantify how you find this overlap, is this something that's being defined? Because it would be very applicable in, like, business use cases, right? Yeah, I guess, okay, from the differential privacy definition I showed you, which is, like, a little bit arcane when you first see it, and the first 50 times you see it, to be honest. Um, but, like, it's possible to go from that to, like, downstream guarantees. For example, um, there's nice papers by a lot of folks, including one by uh, uh, Nicola and his group, um, focused on, like, what does, say, this differential privacy guarantee imply for membership inference in particular, where membership inference is, like, determining whether one specific point is in the training data set or not. So you can convert that guarantee to more user-friendly sort of bounds for specific tasks and allow you to quantify this. Um, cool. Any other questions? Uh, this is kind of the good news part of the talk, and then I'll tell you the bad news and basically tear apart everything I've told you so far. Uh-huh, question? Hi there, uh, I just have a question about, so you're, in this setting, you're differentially private with respect to presumably the, the private fine tuning, but I was curious if it had any impact on the public data set as well. Yeah, that's a great question in the sense that, first of all, there is no formal guarantee afforded by differential privacy here. But you're right in the sense that I think some other folks maybe have looked at, for example, when you do fine tuning, how much of this forgets the secrets from the first part? So we don't specifically look at that, but I think some other folks have. Cool. 
All right, I'll continue now. So, like, this talk was called The Promise and Pitfalls. I've told you about the promise, and now it's time to move on to the pitfalls. Uh, so, I don't know why I use caveats here, but these are sort of critiques raised in a position paper, uh, which was joint work with Florian Tremere and Nicholas Carlini from this year. And the first caveat, which I kind of hinted at before, is that uh, publicly available data is not actually public, right? Um, and you might be thinking, what do I mean by that? But first of all, information posted for one purpose may be inappropriate for another. Uh, if for anyone paying close attention, we didn't actually solve the problem I used as an example at the very beginning, right? So um, GPT-2 is trained on public web information. But nonetheless, remember that if you ask the phone number of Peter W, uh, Peter W is the, the person whose data was memorized when you fed in East Stroudberg, Stroudberg. So like, that was data that was publicly available, but it's still something we're maybe not comfortable with in terms of a privacy violation. Similarly, the Harry Potter example, right? I mean, um, yeah, that's different. Um, like, uh, yeah, for example, Harry Potter is publicly available on the internet, but still training on it as a copyright violation, or I guess the law is unclear, but you know, this may be a copyright violation to use it for training an ML model. So somehow, the context in which something appears online should be taken into account when treating it as a public data set. So, you, you know, kind of the, what, what maybe, if you want a machine learning model to be privacy preserving, that's kind of silly if you're just throwing in all this publicly available data and pretending it's uh, public because it might, it might give you a weird idea of what it means for uh, data to be public. Like, technically nothing is wrong here because I said we're not giving any privacy to the data that's public, to the data that is public, but still I personally consider that a problem. There's other examples. For example, maybe you post some pictures of yourself on your website for professional purposes on your Facebook, but if somebody used that to train a machine learning model to create deep fakes of you, that's clearly something that you didn't consent to. So that's like, you know, things posted for one purpose which may not be appropriate for another. So there's other cases where data may be accidentally, unknowingly, or non-consentingly uploaded. For example, there's, an, there, there's some IRC conversations, which are of a sensitive, con uh, sensitive nature, which uh, for some reason they were being scraped by a bot and it found out, uh, and, it, and they basically made it into GPT-2, GPT-3 training data. There's an example where people have, uh, many examples in fact, people putting their private keys to whatever, um, their crypto wallet or their AWS uh, private key, and this makes it online, and you know, if these are being publicized by GPT-2, uh, this can cost them a lot of money, and so this is not something you'd want to do. And another example I like to mention is surveillance camera footage. This is often something which is like, you know, there's this website where they actually uh, basically find public surveillance cameras where uh, these things are, there's no password on it, but you don't even know you're being recorded. Is it okay to use that in a machine learning model? Maybe, maybe not. And copyright material, as we've already talked about. So, like, yeah, hopefully we give you enough examples that like we can't just take the myopic view that if it's available online, then it is public data and we can do whatever with it. Um, I'll also highlight the fact that this is from the GPT-4 tech report. Um, they use both publicly available data, such as internet data, and data licensed from third-party providers. So technically, this is all data they have access to, but they don't even tell you what it is, much less, you know, uh, the privacy risks of it. So I think this is rather problematic as we have even less idea of what's going on in our training data and what sort of privacy risks it has. So this is sort of uh, one precaution. Maybe one solution that I'll mention is like, maybe there might be some data, which is public data, which is more suitable for use. For example, Project Gutenberg is out of copyright uh, books from like over 100 years old. Maybe, I don't think there should be any privacy concerns with using something like that at this point. Maybe Wikipedia text is a little bit more sensitive, but generally okay-ish. Um, yeah, maybe you could get the consent of the data holders. This is like, you know, maybe OpenAI's least favorite thing to do because they just want more data no matter how it's obtained. But like somehow maybe we need to be more careful about how this data is obtained as well. So this is one thing. I want to also mention another caveat, which is the fact that these benchmark data sets I've mentioned are really silly for privacy. Like the traditional benchmarks, which I've sort of focused on in the image classification setting are things like CIFAR 10, uh, which is like low resolution pictures of boats and horses and dogs and stuff like that. Um, 
And, you know, this is ImageNet, which are just random pictures of natural images. And I don't know. Do you think this uh, dog here cares that his privacy is violated? Probably not. These are, these are not really, there, there are some exceptions, but in general, these uh, pictures are less privacy sensitive than the settings we would actually care about uh, privacy in. So, yeah, I'm being a little, like, not totally precise here, but these sort of natural images may not be privacy sensitive, whereas things like these images, say chest x-rays or eye scans, uh, retinal fundus scans, as they're called apparently, um, these might be the settings that we actually do care about privacy. And these, these are kind of qualitatively different, right? Um, I just want to get across that, like, these, these are not the same type of pictures that we saw before in the sense that, like, if you go on Google and, you know, look for pictures of things, then you'll find millions of examples of dogs and cats and sort of natural images which are qualitatively similar to CIFAR-10 and ImageNet, but not quite as many of, like, chest X-rays, retinal fundus imaging, and stuff like that. So maybe the problem is that uh, when we are trying to measure progress on these, like, we're, we're, we're using CIFAR-10 and ImageNet trying to say, we're getting better at private ML. Look how much better our numbers are. But in fact, we might not actually be measuring anything meaningful because the data sets we actually care about for privacy look nothing like it. So, you know, if you're really, you know, hammering out every little percent of improvement on CIFAR-10, that might actually be spurious in terms of what actually helps the setting we care about. So um, we're in, if you've uh, seen, in fact, the poster that's right out there, uh, there's some work with uh, my students and uh, Florian, which uh, is investigating this. So you should uh, maybe near during the next break, if you're curious, chat with uh, Sabrina and Sarah, who are here at the back, um, at the poster. Um, and another caveat I'll just kind of mention, but not really go too in deep depth on it, is the fact that many of these private ML models that we treat as private, they're like very, very large models, like, you know, Roberta and things like that are things that you can maybe run on a local computer. But some of these bigger models, which may also be proprietary, are not actually things you can run on your own computer. So, for example, I'm sure everyone here has used ChatGPT. How do you do it? You upload the thing you want to ask it, and then they do something on their end uh, and give you an answer back. Um, and this is problematic because you're essentially giving it your data, and then you're just trusting that they won't do anything privacy uh, privacy leaking on their end. So, and this, in fact, has been a problem. For example, Italian regulators raised issue with this because, for example, they train on the queries that you give them. Um, you know, that, that's a privacy concern as well. So, really, another concern we raised is the fact that basically some of these very, very large models may have privacy concerns because you have to send your data to them. There's some solutions to this sort of thing, including say, secure computation, but that also doesn't necessarily work at uh, the scale of, say, GPT or chat GPT like that. So, you know, the sort of suggestion, suggestion that we give in uh, our position paper are along the lines of, A, maybe we need to go to better secure computation. Uh, I don't know too much about that, to be honest, but um, another solution is maybe work more on, say, distillation or making these big, big models, things that are smaller, so that a user, rather than having to upload their data to some cloud service, can run a comparable machine learning model on their phone or something, which, you know, alleviates some of these privacy concerns of a different nature. So, okay, I'll wrap it up here and say the, the sort of the good news part of the talk is that public data can make private ML a lot better. Uh, and I think it really changes the answer to anything you would tell a practitioner before you'd say, okay, fair, it's not usable now. But now, uh, with public data, it does become usable in some contexts. But there's these pitfalls I mentioned, including the fact that, you know, the semantics of what it means for data to be public versus private. Maybe we're not measuring data, or measuring the quality of how much we're improving in meaningful settings. And uh, it doesn't help if you have to send your data to the cloud. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, question? This is more of like a hypothetical, but 
um, a huge part of these models is the data we're feeding in. So do you think if we kind of benchmark the data for privacy and regulate that part of it, it could improve privacy in general? Like you said, right, like there's a lot of ambiguity. Like if you just upload any picture on LinkedIn, it automatically makes its way to Google. It makes its way to lots of databases, right? That's not something you signed up for. You upload a profile picture. So um, are these, like, is that an actual area people are working in? Oh, good question. I'm not sure if people are working in it so much, but I think it would be really cool to see models which, you know, the training data is better is better processed and, like, with more concern for things like privacy. For example, something, say, only trained on Wikipedia and Project Gutenberg data. Okay, I, th I think that will have terrible accuracy because it's, like, that's not very much data compared to the overall thing. But maybe other sorts of uh, processing on your data to try to be really responsible with privacy. I think, I think maybe that's a way to resolve our caveat number one, just really thinking deeply about what you've really done, what, what data you've ingested. Yeah, I, I think it's more applicable in the image side of things, for like violating like, like art and music and all of that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. This is very useful. Yeah. In the language context, it's very complicated to define what um, privacy means for a number of reasons. There's a very nice paper by Brown et al., which uh, I'd recommend taking a look at. Yeah, uh, Reza? Green means yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So thank you for your talk. Uh -huh. So uh, is it just a, a comment and the, uh, the yeah, is it most, mostly a philosophical, I think. You, maybe the problem's coming somehow from the fact that we haven't defined privacy in an in, in unambiguous way in this, uh, and especially the very last piece that you, uh, you, you talked about, about the, whether, in fact, you have to use the data for a specific purpose. So maybe we look at the privacy in context contextual integrity and just look at how we can interpret that definition of privacy in the, rather than just information hiding or control over data. Exactly, yeah. Contextual integrity is another popular area in privacy, which is sort of uh, parallel to this, I guess. And I think taking that into account is an important way forward for this sort of area, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. Um, I have one question, maybe more related to how you motivated the whole talk. But there's like now these parallel works that just kind of figure it out. You know, the way we analyze EPSGD is not tight. We do better. Um, do you know, like, if we do much better if we do these tight analysis? Because we were doing like this 69%, obviously, like, I would say it's abysmal. But, uh. Right. So you're kind of wondering if you, yeah, yeah. You're right in the sense that like um, sort of the moments accountant method is a little bit loose, and there's better accountants nowadays, um, like exact privacy accounting. Um, and I think it helps a little bit. For example, I think epsilon equals 8 goes down to epsilon equals 6.7. So correspondingly, you could, in that new setting, increase epsilon to 8. But I don't think it'll make a, you know, a dramatic shift. Maybe a few more percents you could squeeze out, but not, not on order of magnitude. Uh, yeah, Nicola? I have a more high-level question. I'm wondering what you think about sort of how much of the problem here is a technology problem and how much is policy just I thought you made some really good points at the end of sort of you know when you start uploading your data you kind of lose track of what it's being used for and it seems like what you were saying is basically if we want to solve these kinds of problems it's more like confidentiality it's more something you need to address with some crypto and so it's probably not going to Scale to like the demand there is for these kinds of products. So do you do you think there is something we can flesh out as sort of a research problem for us, or is it more useful that we try and get involved with sort of trying to formalize how basically people will audit sort of the kinds of claims that are made about how the data is handled? Good question. I think there it can become at some both ends in the sense like especially say caveat number one where uh, I think there's something that we could do as like machine learning model trainers, like be more careful of their data, but also I think working with policy folks and stuff like that is also a valid way to start addressing those problems. So, yeah, I, I, a bit of both. Yeah, I think <laughs> a bit of both. Sorry for being a fence sitter, but yeah, combination in my opinion. Cool, yeah, Elliot? Uh, yeah, thanks. So um, I guess one thing about the pre-training fine-tuning paradigm is that for a lot of settings, the pre-training is without labels, 
it's like a generative task for self-supervised, and then the fine tuning is a supervised task. And in terms of how you kind of evoked like learning English and then learning to make a classification, I was thinking that when you fine tune for a supervised loss, oftentimes you actually collapse the representation and you can forget information about what was there in the pre-training. Have you seen examples of trying to do like actually a private language modeling? Like the pre-training on public data is a generative task and then the fine tuning is also a generative task. Sorry, what was the question? I'm, uh, okay, so my question is, is it possible to actually do private, like, generative modeling using this, like, kind of public-private? Yeah, yeah. For example, I mean, we gave some results for natural language generation, for example, um, uh, using GPT-2, which is, like, indeed, uh, yeah, it is generative uh, stuff there as well. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's fairly flexible and different. DPSGD can be used in any place. You'd use SGD, essentially. Know, supervise, self supervise, whatever you want. Cool. Um, sure, we'll take one more question and then. Can I have you have to turn it on. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, may you please evaluate uh, me uh, how uh, private data uh, like uh, secure because uh, I don't know how to store it and maybe we have to encrypt them somehow because. As you know, you didn't mention it, no? So why it's private? Why cool. there's no intermediary uh, that uh, can, like, uh, take and look at them? Right, right. That's a good question. So the thing is, privacy means a lot of different things in different settings. At least in the case where we were mostly concerned about, I sort of hinted at another case at the end, but mostly we're concerned about the case where, say, there's a trusted curator, someone who's going to train the machine learning model, and you trust them to tell them all of your data. Um, this isn't always the case, but we're just assuming that's the case for now. Um, and we want to make sure the trained ML model is a, is, is, doesn't leak secret, secrets after we train it. On the other hand, the, you can also imagine a setting where I don't trust the curator to, uh, to even, I don't trust anyone to look at my data because it maybe has very personal secrets. And then there's other um, solutions to that, which may involve things like multi-party, secure multi-party computation, cryptography, stuff like that, maybe used in combination of different, with differential privacy. The reason is because they both are called privacy, but they're sort of complementary in terms of the threats they try to protect against. But uh, yeah, at least for the sake of simplicity for this talk, we mostly focused on the case where we trust the curator.